to the metal voice. And the first time on the show, I mean, legendary bassist, songwriter, guitarist, I guess co-founder of the Sex Pistols, studio musician. Uh, the yep. list goes on and on. Goes on and on. Glenn Matlock. How you doing today, sir? How you doing? You all right, fella? Yeah. I'm okay. New album. Good. Consequences coming to be released April 27th on Cooking Vinyl. That's right. Um, yes. Which is looming. It's, it's nearly, we're nearly there. Yes. Well, this year's flown by already. So um, there you go. There's actually been a single out called Head on a Stick, which is on YouTube. There's a video for it. And it's, you know, I've been on all the usual suspect um, sites and stuff. So people can check that out beforehand. But um, yeah, I'm pretty pleased with the album. I think it's quite politically pertinent. It was kind of funny. I was in New York over the weekend doing a session with Clem Burke and Richard Lloyd from television and Ivan, uh, Ivan Julian's studio for this movie that somebody's making about a guy who's born and brought up on the Bowery. And we recorded an old song called Bowery Boys. And then I did some press yesterday in New York, but it, well, it coincided with Trump's arraign, arraignment. So that that was kind of interesting. Well, well, I mean, when you talk politically, okay, we, we could talk about the music and then we could talk about the theme. So for those of the people out there who don't understand the politics of the UK, and I'm assuming you're referring to the UK politics. Mainly the, mainly the UK, but not only, yeah. But okay, but I mean, are we talking Brexit? What are we talking about? When we're, we're talking about Brexit. Politics? We're talking about the sort of ridiculous, as I say it anyway. I mean, I don't know idea what your politics are, but there's in Europe, it's that's particularly Britain. There's been a real lurch to the right, and um, you know, it's kind of culminating in people losing rights to strike, rights to do this, that, and the other. I mean, before Brexit, we could just get, get on a ferry, get on a plane, get on the Eurostar, which is fantastic, with your guitar under your arm, and you could go down and go and do a gig and do, do a session and bump into somebody and stay there for as long as you like. We can't do that anymore. It's like a real... And, and I've been brought up. That's the best thing that's ever happened to me in England. That, and it's been wrenched away from us. For no real reason that anybody can see, apart from protecting a whole bunch of politicians and, and fund managers, offshore banking businesses in the Cayman Islands. You know, they've lied to us and they've hoodwinked a whole bunch of working class people into thinking that's the right thing to do. It's crazy. You so, know what? It's a, so, it's a, so it's people... a neighbor of mine who, did, who was doing some work, of mine. He's a pretty, pretty good stonemason, you know, does people's front steps and all that. And he's talking about it and it transpired they voted for Brexit. And I said, well, you know, I, I'd never vote for anything that was going to bugger up anybody else's kind of career or work prospects. You kind of have for my whole industry and a whole bunch of other people who don't work into the nine five thing. I said, well, what do you think when you go abroad? He said, oh, I've never been abroad. <laughs> and it's like, well, how on earth can you make a judgment call if you don't know? You know, I think, what's wrong in this world is that people don't understand other people's cultures and how they go about things. And in my getting on for 50 years of being a musician and it's been, you know, it's not always top of the pops and doing massive gigs. You're doing this, that and the other here, there and everywhere to pay the rent and do a session and stuff. Meet people all around the world and everybody's much the same. You know, they want to look after their families. They want to put some food on the table they want to kind of let be out, let their hair down without much, too much let or hindrance. But, Everybody's but, the same everywhere. You but, know? but it's all it's all about information, right? So let's let's just educate people in like ten seconds here. Prior to Brexit, Britain was part of the European Union. Yeah, and when and being part of the European Union means free movement of labor and and, and products, exactly, which means yeah. a band can play in London. Yep. And the next day they can play in Paris with without showing passports, without showing, uh, maybe there is a certain passport check, but more or less it's the free movement of goods and services. Yeah, and now exactly. that Brexit happened, it's like they broke off from the European Union. They're now an isolated territory yep. and taxes and the free movement 
has stopped. Therefore, bands can no longer just easily tour throughout Europe, correct? Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, you can still tour a bit, but it's, you know, now you've got to get involved with car names for equipment, you know, and if you take a guitar and it breaks, as guitars do, and you pick up another one in a, in a shop in Paris or something like that to see you through, you've broken your car name, you know, and you're liable for all these import duties and taxes and things and it the whole the whole thing is just a nonsense it, it, it you know it's all obstacles they kind of put up but it's not only that it's they've used that as a way to enable the right wing in britain to kind of tread over everybody but we've got one of the most corrupt governments we've ever had they're brazen with their corruptness and they think they're better than everybody else and they, they're not there to serve the nation, they think they're, you know, a station above everybody and they can do what they like. Well, I think they're going to come right on stuck. I sincerely hope so. They look like they're going to get a complete hide in at the next election, but they're trying to gerrymander the borders and people's writing, voting rights and things. You know, now we've had about two cases of election fraud where people voted twice. And now for younger people, Mm-hmm. You have to show ID. Now, it's maybe it's not a good thing, but not everybody can get ID. Not everybody's got a driving license. Not everybody's got a passport, and you might be out of vote. And they're doing it deliberately because they know it's only the old codgers and pensioners and things, which I am actually officially, really, um, who will vote for these right-wing nutcases. You know, and it's not, it's not it's not only England. I mean, it's been happening in America. You know, and I've been fortunate that I've toured America a lot on many different levels, you know, in the front of the plane and, and in a van, you know, I did a tour eight, nine years ago, me and Sylvain Sylvain, we did from the New York Dolls, we did the double header acoustic tour, which was a great laugh driving around, but in the middle of America, there's a whole load of trailer parks and they are not holiday homes, you know, so I can see why somebody like Trump comes along and says, oh, we look out for you. He ain't going to do that. I, I love the thing that uh, Obama said before the, the election where Trump got in. He said, you, you think this guy's going to look out here? Come on. You know, they, they claimed electoral fraud as well, the same way you're claiming electoral fraud. Yeah. But, uh, no, I'm saying... Every, that, every side I, claims I, electoral fraud. What right? I'm saying now is, is that they are doing deliberate official electoral fraud to stop people from voting. Gotcha. That's gotcha. kind of what's happening. You know, that's I'll what tell, I'll, I'll tell you something. In England is, UK is not alone. It happens worldwide too. You know, and you're right. Well, I know. Right. You, know, yeah, yeah. you know, I know that. And, but it's particularly affecting me. And that's led to me writing the songs that I wrote on my album. But, you know, the more I investigate it and I've become, you know, not that I haven't been that politically involved, but you, all you can really do is vote. But now, you know, if there's a march, I'll go on it. And and in fact, I went on one, which be just prior to Brexit, which I kind of sum up as Brexit, Brexit is dopey kind of march. But there was a million people on the march. It didn't get particularly reported. I bumped into Kevin Rowland from Dexy's Midnight Runners. We're mm. walking along Piccadilly, and just behind us, there was a, a big black guy who had a big tricycle with a trailer with a big ghetto blaster on the back pumping out music. Then he was playing Let's Stick Together by Brian Ferry, you know, his version of the Cam Heat song. And I thought, what a great place to have your song played while we are marching to Parliament Square to have a go at them and let people know what you think. So some of the songs I wrote, kind of, I had that in the back of my mind, you know. That's why I wrote that head on a stick uh, song yeah, and yeah, consequences yeah. coming, you know. You know what I, I, I love about the, the family of uh, the Sex Pistols, we'll call it that family tree. Everyone's got an opinion. Everyone's got a very strong opinion. And that's good. And that's healthy. Right. I know even Johnny Rodden, he's on the other side, right? He's, kind of he's on the other, other side. side. Yeah. He's on the other side. But I don't know if he is. I think he just says what he says just to kind of get his boat race in the paper. Really. You know, I don't you, you, know. You, I, I doubt his sincerity about all that. But I, by coming out on the other side, whether you vote for Trump or the Tories in England, I'm not even sure where he's allowed to vote these days. And if you don't mean it, I think that's pretty poor. Um, let's talk about, okay, that's the political angle of the new album, which I find it very interesting. 
and then you have the music. Describe to people what they can expect. I mean, I, I know there's a few singles that were released, but what can they expect to hear? Well, in terms of you know, I, I was born in the 50s. First records I ever put on were um, Jerry Lee Lewis and on 78s and Elvis and stuff like that. You know, they had, really had something going for it. And then in the early 60s, we had pirate radio in England where bands like the Kinks and the Who and the Yardbirds and the Early Stones and the Small Faces come through, came through. And that, that was very impressionable upon me. And we also had a great TV show called Ready, Steady, Go, where all of those bands would play live. Plus, you know, you would have the t early Tamla Motown stuff, you know, and, and Smokey Robinson and Martha Reeves and the Vandellas. It was all fantastic. That's my kind of yardstick for writing a kind of three, three and a half minute pop rock song that's and all those people in the songs that I've mentioned that were hits you know they weren't bringing down the government song but there was some kind of small consequence about all of them you know they were worthwhile things to be singing about and that, that's what I kind of allude to every time I write a song you know I think it's, it's a good blueprint or a yardstick now I don't want to sound old fashioned and like that but that's the kind of the crux of the the building of the song, but then also over the years, I've I've met and become friends with, worked with um, some fantastic musicians. Um, you know, I I got to say that I really enjoyed it. I found it very melodic, and you know, it's always great to have a little bit of a meeting in there, which makes it even more enjoyable. It's got yeah. that it's a little bit of she bop. It's got a cover tune by Katie Lang and. Uh, I think it's Ben Mink who wrote the song. Uh, well, I knew I'd be talking to some of you Canadian types, so I thought I'd... <laughs> right. but I, I, I it's not only about what's in. It's not all... I, I think it's got great sentiment. You know, that there's something better that we can all yearn and long for. Um, it's, it's a song called Constant Graven. Yes. I didn't Constant even realise when I did it that, it, that some of these few people have told me it's kind of a big gay um, anthem kind of thing. Well, good for them, you know. Mm -hmm. Don't really bug me. It's a good song, but you know, I like to throw in my last album, "Good to Go." I actually did a cover of the Scott Walker song called "Montague Terrace in Blue," which is a big, big ballad. And I just want to throw a curveball in and make people think that there's more than Blitzkerry Bop in life, you know. And there's nothing <laughs> wrong with Blitzkerry Bop, but there's other stuff that's cool too, you know. And some of the tracks on the album, there's a, there's a track on the album called. Um, all speaking in tongues, which again is like all these politicians talk so much nonsense, they might as well be speaking in tongues. But musically, it could be something from Goat's Head Soup or Exile on Main Street. You know, it's got that kind of groove to it. But my version of it, you know, I don't want to sound exactly like somebody else. I want to try and put something newer forward in my own kind of, you know, within the realms and the parameters of what I do, but you can allude to things. And as long as it don't sound like pastiche, it's fine. You know, you know, it's amazing. Like I'm listening to this album and I, and I commend you on it. I think it's really enjoyable. It's got a Thank nice, you. it's all about the melody. And I think you've always been that unsung hero of melody. Well, you, you, you know what? That, that, I, I'm glad you picked up on that because even songs, you know, like Anarchy in the UK and God Save the Queen, if John had had it totally his own way, I mean, he wrote the lyrics for those songs and they're, they're good, interesting lyrics and he delivers them great. But if there, if there wasn't a good tune behind it, nobody would remember him. You know, and if it had his way, it would have sounded like Nice by Bergarten or, you know, a German industrial band or something like that. Then nobody would be talking about it these days. So in music, there's a yin and the yad. Of, of, of going about things. And I think what was good about Pistols, we had most of those angles covered, you know, just through the personnel and talking to them. Let me ask you this. Why was there never a second album ever? Like, I mean, here you are, the band reunites and you write another tour and another tour of the Sex Pistols. You're a great songwriter, as we can see on this new album. You got a lot in you. Why didn't the Sex Pistols just come out with a second album? Because... We were young, impetuous, and full of beer, and argued with each other too much. In but that's fact, the whole. But that's the beauty yeah, of yeah, it. I know, but we didn't even <laughs> argue with each. Like, you know what the problem with the pistols was? Is not everybody said what they thought to somebody else, and not to the band guys themselves. We never spoke enough, really. You know, and I think a few more kind of real hum thing in conversations, it could have cleared the decks a bit more, and we would have made a second album. 
But if you look at everybody else's output, you know, John's public image stuff and what I've done with Richard, I've done loads of things, and Steve and Paul, you know, all in demand musicians and songwriters and contribute to things. We all had it in us to make another second album, but I just, I just don't think we were kind of, you know, Malcolm McLaren, you could almost say he was like the shepherd of the flock that was the band. I don't think he was a very good shepherd as far as that was concerned. No. I, I guess since I've, you know, I followed the Sex Pistols since I was a, a young kid till today, I've always said, have, have these guys even discussed doing an album? Like, it must have been brought up. You have just so much. There is so much not, angst that all of really, Not really. Yeah, not really back then. But when we reformed in 1996, um, we spoke about the and that. And me, Steve, Paul were up for it, and John wasn't. So there you go. Okay. And it, I think he was kind of frightened that all our stuff is up on a pedestal, and if we did something that didn't come up to scratch, then it wouldn't kind of chip away at the pedestal kind yeah. of fair enough but I see that sort of as a challenge and we could have written some stuff yes had a go then if it was no good then but put, don't put it out but we didn't even do that but the tour was cool you know so you know what I, I think there is enough uh, quality music in all of you to combine to create that that brilliant second album but you know it is what it is right? well, I, I, well thank you I agree but there you go. Is it, uh, yeah, I think the time to do that has been and gone now. So there well, you go. Look, look, I don't know about that. I mean, you came out with a very uh, sort of like, uh, I wouldn't call I it didn't, a rhythm. I didn't vote for Trump. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is that what it comes down to? <laughs> well, you I, couldn't have anyways. You couldn't well, have well, anyways. If you, you know, if you was a stalk, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not blinking Lenin or Stalin or or Tarek Ali, or Jerry Rubin, the leader of the Yippies. I'm not like that. I'm Glenn Matlock from the Arrow Road, write a few songs, but I do not want to stand on stage next to somebody with a MAGA hat on. All it's right. not a good. It's not a good look. But 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 thinking again, going back in time when you were with Johnny on stage, wasn't it the same feeling? Anyways, wasn't it? Didn't you guys not butt heads? Anyways, I mean, did you? We did. We, we did. We did. But. I the same dynamic is there. That's what I'm trying to I say. I think the same dynamic is there. And that was probably what was kind of made it exciting. You know, and there was a, a three okay. song That's kind right. of there. But there was something about the fella that I didn't trust. And I think it's taken a long time to for me to realize what that was all about. And in the past few years, I've realized what that was all about. So Go going to the documentary or the series, I, I the series, not the documentary. I, I've, I've watched it and I really enjoyed it. I don't know right. how much of it is true, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very disappointed in actually considering I had meetings with um, Danny Boyle about it. And what I'm I'm not disappointed that it it came out, and I'm not disappointed. And I thought it was important that it went ahead because it was based on Steve's story and take on things, and he was the guy that formed the band, not John. Steve, yeah. John was the last one in the band. I thought it was important that it, but. My portrayal, and not even by the actor, but the script, and particularly in my leaving the band, I left the band. I was not sacked. That whole episode where Steve sacked him, it, it's just bollocks. And so I'm that, really bathroom, that bathroom scene never happened? You never, never went happened. to the bathroom? Never happened. You know, the rehearsal room that we had, that where there's all these people dancing and partying, it was about as big as your bathroom. <laughs> You know, what about just, what just about Hollywood the and things and you know and the whole thing with with uh, you know a big party and being on a double decker bus with when Steve stood up, Chrissy, it just never happened. It's, it's nonsense. What about when you when you were signing the the record contract and you were sort of the only guy who was saying, "Wait a second, you're questioning everything. You're going." You were, you were looking out for the financial security of the band, right? It well, just... I was. That, that probably did them any favours in the long run, but somebody had to. I mean, even back was then, that true? I do was remember that... saying to John, he said, well, look, I'm going to sign this. He, he, he said, but you've read it, and if there's anything wrong with it, it's your fault. That's what he said to me. <laughs> so that is, that is fact. You were the <laughs> only one looking out for everyone from a financial perspective. Yeah. 
kind of. It just seemed to, you know, somebody take 25% right off the top. It's, it's, a genius. it's a bit of a tall order, you know. <laughs> what else did you find? Okay, the Chrissy Hind and the Steve Jones relationship. According to Chrissy Hines, that really was completely exaggerated. I mean... But, but I, I know Chrissy. She's my neighbor in London. You know, I was talking about it. She said I only slept with him once. You know, so there was like, no romantic, there was no like flash dance. Well, I mean, they were mates and they're still mates to this day, you know. And, and Steve is a particular kind of character. We, we've all got to give him that. Um, you know, I mean, then he kind of, he's, he's a sod, <laughs> but he charms his way through in his own Steve Jones go the way through life and gets away with everything. You know, Steve Jones, he's done this, that and the other. And one day, you know, when we all pass on, and we'll go to the pearly gates, and um, you know, I'm half joking here, but St. Peter or whoever is supposed to be up there will go. You know, those things when people say, "I've written a few words for my, you know, um, uh, my incoming." <laughs> no, no, a few words for for my um, what do you call it? Um, my right. actors is getting bored. You know. Oh, okay. My, yes. Yes. You know, for okay. my. Um, Oscars. Ivor or what's it called? Oscars? Um, yeah, for my Oscar award. So I've written a few words and I, I open up the thing and go, please like that. <laughs> and then put some people will go, now Steve, what about this, 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 and that? And Steve Jones will put on a little smile and he go, yeah, sorry about that, but listen. And the bloke will go, yeah, all right then. He's that kind of guy, you know. <laughs> what would you have liked to see? And I enjoyed the series regardless of all the myths or the sort of like uh, exaggerations. What would you have liked to see portrayed about you that wasn't in the movie? Well, I just the whole thing that, you know, how it led up that I left the man and I had a whole big meeting with Malcolm about it and Stephen Paul and said, you know, they said to me, can't you just, Paul said to me, can't you just pretend you like John? I said, well, not really, no. You know, I, I'm writing all these kind of tunes and things and if you can't back me up a bit more, if, if that's what you want, that's what's going to happen. That's what happened. We're seven stuff. And I just think it should have been more truthful. And I think I think the real story is more gritty and, and truthful than the thing. And I, I met Danny Boyle again in Los Angeles after it came out, and I'd had a private scream. And he went, oh, how are you doing? Danny, you're a cunt. Right? And he's like, whoa, whoa. So he knows where I'm coming from on it. You know? But, um, when, when you, did you have any input or say in the series? At the beginning, I had some meetings with with Danny, particularly in the production team, and um, I thought it had all been ironed out, but then I was ignored. So I'm not happy. I feel shafted. What about Paul Cook? What do you think that wasn't in the movie that should have been about him? Um, well, you know, that he had a bigger part to play. I mean, I don't think Paul's 100% happy about it. I think he sort of comes across... I went to see it with my son, Louis, and I was a bit embarrassed, really, when I watched that. And Louis sort of quite astutely said, he said, well, the thing is, you know, I know you did this, that, and the other, and, it, and, it, and I also know it's about Steve. He said, but you and Paul just come across as, like, real kind of two-dimensional characters. There's no sort of background, your, your family and all that. A bit of that could have been in it, and it refreshed things out a little bit more and made it a bit more kind of real, you know. And you could say, well, there's not time for all that in it. Well, there was the whole episode on Chrissy and I not getting married to stay, which took up an hour of everybody's lives, which never happened. You know. <laughs> Did she ever get married in the in the UK, Chrissy Hines? I don't know. I don't remember. I don't know if she did. Well, she married Ray Davis. I know that. Oh, no, she, she married Ray Davis was later on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not, I, not back then. I didn't, no. Not back then. So she didn't, she wanted a, a visa, I guess, or getting a visa started. Well, yeah, was, she wanted to be kosher, you know, basically. Was, was Malcolm McLaren, was he as evil as he was portrayed in the film? Well, I think the guy who plays him pretty good, that whole courtroom scene. He's got Malcolm down to a T, really. Um, he was a tricky, tricky fellow. He's very interesting, erudite, funny. Um, I don't think he comes across as evil. I think he comes across as highly crafty, which is different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. What about yeah. that court courtroom scene? 
at the well, beginning. Well, that's what I was talking about particularly. I but, think but, the but that was, was that a real event that that actually happened? Well, I wasn't in the court that day, so I don't know. But the way the, the actor portrays Malcolm, you know, with all the flowery language and turning things around um, to his advantage from whatever the beat, you know, the judge had to say, I thought they kind of got that pretty good. But whether the actual words used and whether Malcolm drove there in Vivian Westwood's mini by himself, I don't think I don't think he'd even know how to open the door with the key, you know. Yeah. So, so. I, I guess you must get tired of being asked every single day of your life about the Sex Pistols. Well, not often. I've only been up an hour, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, it must be. It must be. You know how many years has it been, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's like it's yeah, like crazy. getting on for fifty years. You know, it's, fifty years. That, that, you know, and I, I, start, I don't get up in the morning and think about oh, it's been sex pistols. You know, I like to live in the present, doff my cap to the past, and look to the future, and that's what I always try and do. But I have to do interviews to to push things, and and um, people ask me about it. What well, what I, I did, what I did hey, what appreciate, can I do, you know. No, no, absolutely. What I did appreciate about the series was it showed you in a positive sense as the sort of melodic composer and Paul Cook too. Like he was the backbone of the band. And without, without you two guys, it's just yelling after that, right? I mean, well, there you go. You know, but that's why I said earlier on yeah, when we were chatting, yeah. Mr. You know, we had all angles covered with the band. You know, there was a yin and a yang. Is it a yin and yang or a yin and yang? Or yin and yang, uh, you know, everything was covered. You know, the nuttiness and the musicality and the the intention and the cleverness, and and there was a lot of humour involved as well. You know, I think one of the things that sums up the Pistols more than anything else is in the pretty vacant video they made after I left, where Steve has got a knotted anarchy handkerchief on his head. You know, which comes from. Well, that's what the working class blokes used to do when they went to the beach. You know, they didn't have that, so they get the handkerchief out and make a hat out of it. You know, what self respecting lead guitarist would do that other than Steve? You know, and it's funny. There's that whole humor involved, you know. I, I think you already answered this question. They call you up tomorrow, they go, let's let's just do a little mini tour of, of wherever, you know, I don't know, UK, USA, wherever. Would you do it? Well, I always say never say never again, but I would say no MAGA hats. Okay, if there was no MAGA hats, that would be on your rider, right? That yeah, would be on but, the sort of... yeah, but then there's probably no MAGA hats. So I, I'm a big fan of the faces, right? Okay. And um, their last single, which they put out as I was breaking up, was called You Can Make Me Dance, You Can Make Me Sing. And then in brackets, it says, Mend the fuse, do the ironing, take the rubbish out, put the cat out, or any other um, menial housekeeping duties. It's actually on the title of the song. So it would have no mega hats or arsiness or not buying around. Or, you know, there'd be a whole disclaimer of things before I signed up to it. Well, you know, I'll make a statement. Like, and I watched the video of you guys in 1996. You guys were on fire. I've never, you were probably better back then than you were when you first started out. Yeah. On possibly, fire. On fire. Possibly, and, possibly so, you know. And, and really, looking back, I mean, I'm 66 now. It, 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 when we did the thing, John's a bit older than me, and Steve's a year older than me. But both me and Paul, you know, Steve, John was going fat 40 and back when I was with a fat, and we weren't even 40. We were still 39, so we had the ump about that. But that was 20 odd years, no, 25 or more years ago now. You know, yeah, so yeah. we were still relatively young men. Consequences coming. Are you planning on touring? I want to. In fact, I'm here in Los Angeles to, mainly to do. Um, we're doing Coachella with Blondie. I'm playing with Blondie at the moment. Oh, I, yeah. I, I came over here. We did a show in Miami. Then we went to Mexico City, did a festival. Bogota, we did a couple of shows there and then came back here. And, you know, I can't get going backwards and forwards to England, so I thought I'd hang out. But I'm actually going to do a show at the Roxy on the 29th of April. Clem's going to play drums and we've got some sort of pickup musicians but um uh there's a guy called steve fishman who's a mate he's pretty good he's going to play bass but also gilby clark's going to play lead guitar nice. so nice. we've had one rehearsal already it's saying it sounds good you know so well, that's going to be my american promo show for now but yeah i want to be out and out, out and about playing 
my stuff as well. You know, okay. I, like, I like playing with different people because sure. it's, everything's a learning curve. You know, Blondie are a great bunch. They've got a fantastic canon of, of, of work. Debbie's a great front person lady. She sings like a bird. You know, when we was re- when I started rehearsing with them, I did some shows with them last year. You know, and they got a proper crew. You know, with, with maybe too many people knocking around in the rehearsal room. And the sound guy said, "Glenn, can, you know, is everything all right?" And I said, um, "Well, can you turn Debbie up?" And he said, "Well, it's pretty loud." I said, "Yeah, no, but I like it. Just turn it up a bit." You know. So um, there you go. I mean, I could talk to you all day, but I won't. Uh, I'll, I'll leave you be. I know you had a really rough, uh, you know, morning there. Consequences yeah. coming. Yeah. Uh, to be released April 27th on Cooking Vinyl. I guess you could pick it up everywhere. Hopefully there'll be a little mini tour somewhere. Maybe one day you'll come to Canada. I don't yeah, know. I mean, I'd, I'd love to come to Canada. When I go, I'm going back um, right now. We're playing here on the 29th, as I said, and I go back to England on the 30th. I've got about four or five band shows over there with my stuff. And then I've got a whole bunch of like acoustic kind of in-stores and things all through May. And then I pick up with Blondie again through June and we got a big show with Iggy Pop on the 1st of July nice. Iggy Pop Blondie and Generation Sex which is Steve Jones Paul Cook Billy Idol and Tony James so that should be interesting backstage um, very very yeah, yeah, yeah uh, a lot going on you know it's been a, been a pleasure thank you so much for your time yeah now what I was going to say so. So, yeah it's been fun it's been so, fun chatting. I do want to say, I don't know if anybody's ever told you, but you don't have to look like Robert De Niro. I get right. that. I get that. Okay. At least five times a month. You get that. Right. I'm at the, I'm at the dentist office, and he goes, oh, well, you know what? You, Boy, you... you kind of look like Robert De Niro, he says. <laughs> I'm at the store. Yeah, you kind of look like Robert hey, De Niro. I you... talk to guys like you. You kind of look like Robert De Niro. Well, I think I think maybe that's why we're getting on a lot. Because you know what I get? I, I come back from... Um, Columbia the other day and there's a quite a nice cafe around the corner I know where it is and go around there and I walked in and the guy says hey you Al Pacino I get that all the time <laughs> so, we could do a movie hey, together we could go? do a movie oh, <laughs> we could do a movie together it's true you do look like Al Pacino jeez yeah but I did, I did say to him the thing is I'm not I said but Al Pacino must get really mad people going up to him saying he doesn't have to look like Glenn Matlock out of the sex business. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure Robert De Niro's getting... Didn't I see you in Montreal last month? Yeah. <laughs> Canada. <laughs> cool. All right, my friend. Thank you so much. All right, fella. Thanks.